grandmother had converted to the Catholic faith when she married my grandfather. My family are Roman Catholics. Uh, but my great aunt Mary from Nova Scotia was a, a Baptist and she knew her scripture. She knew her scripture very well. Uh, but she was brought uh, to visit me by my grandmother and I had these two lovely uh, older ladies in uh, the room that I was painting icons. And so here's here is uh, my grandmother, my great aunt Mary and me and we're surrounded by a lot of icons. As I, I was painting a lot of icons in those days. Uh, and my aunt was, was a very nice lady, very proper, very polite. She looked around and, she, and I ta told her a little bit about the icons. It was a big icon of the Savior. And my great aunt said to me, well, this is very nice, but we don't have idolatry in our church. And I thought, wow. Um, she really came right out with that. She called me an idolater. Then she went on, as if that weren't enough, to say, and we believe that God cannot be painted because he's infinite. I thought for a minute and I said, well, Aunt Mary, our church teaches us that God is infinite and that God cannot be depicted. And, but the fathers go on to say he cannot be defined he cannot be described, he cannot be contained, he cannot be circumscribed. You can't draw a big enough circle, even if it's as big as the whole universe, big enough to contain all of God. And I told her, however, we're also taught that when God came to the Virgin Mary and took flesh from her, he became describable because he became a real man. The church teaches that he is fully God and fully man. And if Christ is fully man, then he can be depicted. And we believe if he can be depicted, he ought to be. One thing that my aunt said to me when I said that God, the, the, the church teaches that Christ is fully God and fully man. She said, well, that's just basic Christianity. She almost said it as if she were accusing me of something. And I thought, well, that's what the fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Councils said. When we say iconoclasm, we can use the word in a few different ways. Iconoclasm simply means icon smashing. And we see lots of iconoclasm throughout history, even up until the present day. Iconoclasm, when did it start? Is generally dated from 7, the year 730, to the year 843, with a break right about in the middle, uh, in 7. 87. We have the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which defended the use of icons in the church. Uh, but iconoclasm, uh, the period of iconoclasm takes place just before and just after the Seventh Ecumenical Council. What was the iconoclastic controversy? This was that period in the 8th and the 9th century where icons, particularly in Constantinople and the East, were deemed by the Byzantine government, and eventually most of the Byzantine church, to be uh, illegal, and they were destroyed. Uh, there was iconoclastic teaching, which basically said, God cannot be depicted, so it is against the faith and heretical to paint his icon. Um, it was also said that venerating icons and treating them with honor and respect was idolatry, plain and simple. These were the basic beliefs of iconoclasm, and of course there's much, much, much more to it than that. There were many defenders of the icons, um, and they were treated in a number of different ways depending on the time uh, during the iconoclastic controversy and the circumstances and who they were. Some were treated with indifference, some were treated with persecution, some were uh, treated with vigorous bodily persecution, and some were even martyred. So you have uh, the full gamut of experience here. Uh, there were those who believed that this was something worth laying their lives down for. There were those, uh, particularly in the West at the time, who really didn't understand what the struggle was about. It's just art after all, some theologians in the West said. Why be struggling in this way? Both sides are wrong to take this so seriously. Uh, but uh, both the iconoclasts and the supporters of the icon um, 
understood that this was a struggle for the faith. The defenders of the holy icons considered iconoclasm to encompass all the heresies that had come before. It was a struggle that asked, who is Christ? What is Christ? Uh, St. Theodore the Studite taught that if you are going to tell me that Christ can't be depicted in an icon, then you're telling me that Christ was not fully human. And if Christ is not fully man, then um, our teaching is wrong. Because Christ is a real man, he can be depicted. Um, and that when we depict Christ, we're not depicting Christ in his nature, in his essence, but in his person. If he was a real person who was born as a real uh, baby, held in the arms of his mother, grew up, was seen by the apostles, walked about the Holy Land, teaching, performing his miracles, he is a real person and he is representable. Worshipping an icon would be idolatry. And of course, we can't practice idolatry. The martyrs died for not practicing idolatry. So the Christian community is terribly serious about this distinction. The fathers of the Seventh Ecumenical Council are very clear when they say that worship, we might say in English also for worship, true adoration is for God alone. Icons are venerated, or we might say honored. Um, but you actually will hear the word worship applied to icons in hymns once in a while. I think it's important to understand that when we think of worship now in the modern era, it has a very, it has more of a specific meaning to the adoration of God. Uh, but worship in earlier times had a broader meaning, and it also meant just plain honoring. Okay, That's why it can be a little confusing from time to time. But I think that we understand the difference, especially in practice, because we honor the icon, we worship only God. St. Stephen, who's called St. Stephen the New, to distinguish him from the proto-martyr Stephen. Uh, St. Stephen uh, was born in the early 8th century, prior to the struggle for the icon, spent most of his life in the struggle for the holy icons. Uh, he became a monk, he became a well-known elder of a large monastery, and he became a well-known defender of the icon. He was thrown into prison with many of his monks. St. Stephen, though, uh, illustrated an important understanding of the icon. He was uh, brought before the emperor. He was uh, told that um, to venerate an icon was idolatry. And St. Stephen asked for a coin to be produced. Uh, and somebody brought him a coin. Um, we have to remember, he was a very respected figure. So this was a prominent event, this uh, discourse in front of the emperor and the court, and it was duly recorded. Uh, so a coin is produced, and St. Stephen says, well, whose image is on this coin? And of course the emperor says, well, that's my image. St. Stephen says, what would happen if I treated this coin with disrespect? Um, and he was told, you'd be arrested, because that's the emperor's image on that coin. St. Stephen said, uh, the image of the king of heaven is likewise to be treated with respect. Um, and again, as we understand, the respect given to the image goes not to the image, but to the person who's represented in that image. With that, St. Stephen drops the coin on the ground and steps on it. This is a uh, 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 this is a terrific, Im uh, a terrific example of not respecting the image of the emperor, and he was immediately seized um, and arrested for doing that. So he illustrated very well. He hadn't done anything to the emperor. He hadn't laid hands on him. He hadn't said anything bad about him, but he had treated the emperor's image with disrespect, and it was a natural reaction that he was seized upon for doing that. St. Stephen was arrested, um, thrown back into prison, um, where he underwent uh, 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 much suffering, uh, much deprivation, and eventually uh, he was taken out onto the street and dragged around. He ends up uh, becoming a martyr and a confessor. So uh, he's killed. Um, St. John 
of Damascus, who himself was quoting St. Basil the Great, who said that the honor paid to the icon goes to the one who's depicted in the icon. We treat photographs of people that we love with a certain kind of respect. Um, I've got a picture of my grandfather, to whom I was very close. If it falls on the floor, I'll very carefully pick it up and dust it off. I have a certain affection for that photograph, not because I am loving this piece of paper, but because I love my grandfather. When we go into church, um, or we come into our homes and we see icons and we make the sign of the cross, we kiss the icon. Um, yes, we are kissing the icon. That's, that's definite. There's no, there's no uh, ambiguity there. But why are we kissing this icon? Because it represents someone we know, someone we love. In the case of venerating an icon of the Savior, it represents he who we are worshiping. My teacher said something um, to me, which I think, again, this had, a, this had a profound effect on me, and I think that it's, it's an interesting thought about the icon. But he said to me, well, iconography is so difficult to understand because it's so simple. All of the struggle that we do as iconographers, and we do a lot of it, uh, to get the proportions right, to get the colors right, to get the composition right. Um, and we really do struggle with these things. Um, we will uh, pull other people into the room, painters and not painters. Do you think this looks okay? Is the nose crooked? Are the eyes in the right place? Um, there's a lot of struggling to get it right and to paint the icon well. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all to produce a simple image that, uh, that doesn't distract when someone stands before it. Um, I think that if an icon painter paints an icon of the Savior, someone looks at it or is looking at it and is just simply moved to say, in that person's heart, Lord have mercy on me, a sinner, then the icon has done its job.